Hey, I love this series. I love our, the Jordan and just all that has gone into it, and it is just marvelous. Um, but I love the Word of God that has been presented throughout this series. Are y'all blessed by this entire series? It's been so good. Amen. You can clap to that. It's, it has just been phenomenal. Uh, I love Michael Jordan, but you know what? I love the Word of God and what God has done in and through me through this series. If you're able this morning, will you stand to your feet in the reading of God's Word? And I'm going to greet our online church. Online church, we love you so much. Thank you so much for being a part of this service. And we are looking forward to what God has for us. Now, I'm going to read this scripture to you this morning in James, and then we will pray together. It says this, every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. I love this. Every good and perfect gift. It means every good thing is not from that person or auntie or uncle. No, no, no. It's from God. It's not from the church. No, it's, it's from God. Every good thing is from above. And I love this. Who does not change like the shifting shadows? So that means the good things that we have experienced, that there's more good to come. Because he hasn't changed. That means we can trust and lean into him today to know that he has more good for us. That's exciting. Let's pray today together. Father, we thank you for who you are. God, we thank you that your word does not return void. And so what does that mean for us today? That means what we bring to the table matters. That means that we need to be hearers of the word, listen in, but then be doers of the word of God. And it will change our lives and change the people around us. So we thank you for that, Father. God, I pray over every environment in this place and online. God, I pray for the environment of our mind. What is going through our thoughts right now that you would have your way? God, I pray over our spirit right now that you would have your way. God, I pray over our online campus as well and in this environment here. God, I pray over me as I do every Sunday that you would have your way. That every word from my mouth is directed by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, have your way. God, we love you and we thank you. And we all said, amen, amen. Glad you're in church. Some of y'all looking at the theme verse here, I'm like, that says James. We're supposed to be in Joshua. Um, well, we are, all right? We're in Joshua. But there is an, an importance to this verse. And it's because this, it, that sometimes in life, we, we go through life and things happen that we don't want to happen. And I'll just be real with you, this week uh, has been a little bit of a trial for me. A lot of things going on, a lot of pulling different ways, and the uniqueness of, and, and thank you for the wisdom that God has given me. Thank, I thank the Lord so much for that um, in this process to know the attack of the enemy. And so we have to understand something today is, is that the enemy doesn't want you to pay attention today. He wants everybody to distract you. He didn't want you to come. He didn't want you to have a good week. He, want, he wants to mess up your world, right? And so what I have learned in this process of surely planting this church, anytime we do a launch meeting of any sort, that week is attacked. And I mean, I'm just telling you, I can step back and I can see the schemes because he's not creative. He attacks in, in specific ways. And so for me in that moment, I can, look, I can look at this week and say, you know what? I feel attacked, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to attack back, yeah. right? And so sometimes we have weeks where we feel so attacked, we feel so messed up, and we feel like, oh my goodness, I'm never going to achieve I'm never, going, I'm never going to do what I, I'm called to do. Or, you know what, I've had a week from the other place and not that place, and, and I don't even know if God's in it. And so what we have to understand today, and put that theme verse back up there, is this, is he does not change. He's still with you when you're getting attacked. He's still with you. He's never left you. He will never forsake you. He's always with you. And sometimes, though, we think we you know what, I, I was supposed to do this, and I did that. Well, now, now these people aren't going to be saved. Or, you know what, that church plant's never going to go. Or, or whatever it may be. And we get, we get so caught up in the big picture of things that we miss what God has called us to do today. And so maybe you like what I'm saying, but maybe you'll listen to it a little bit from this other guy that we've talked about. You might know him, Michael Jordan. And he said this, and I like what he said. He says, he's talking about the big championship. And he says, I would tell the players, I would tell my players to relax and to never think about what's at stake. Just think about the basketball game. If you start to think about who is going to win the championship, you lost your focus. 
And for many of us on the spiritual side, we say, you know what? How, how am I going to win my family to Christ? How, am I, how is this going to happen in my life? How am I going to start a godly business? And God is saying, will you, will you practice with me? Will you, will you, will you get back to the, to the basics of what this is? So I know you like the basketball game, but do you know what this is? A basketball, right? Do you know how to dribble? Do you know how to shoot? Do you know how to, are you, are you, are you focused on passing the anointing away to somebody else? Are you, are you ready to encourage the team that you're with and, and, and understand it's not a solo sport, right? And so in that moment, we have to understand that we get caught up in the big picture at times and God's saying, I need you to get back to practice. I need you to get back to the basics of what matters. And I'm going to tell you today, we're going to get back to the basics. All right, we're going to go back to the basics. I'm a little jealous of, of Jeff and my wife who got to kind of preach just the, hey, let's go get the world. Let's, let's see the walls fall down. Today, I'm going to have to get all up in the business. All right, we're going to get all close and talk about some things that are going to be like, oh, okay, okay. All right, why? Because God loves you. And he wants, he, yeah, he wants to see you achieve. He wants you close to him. And so, yeah, we might talk about some things that are going to get a little close, but praise God that we're willing and we care enough about you to do so. You know what? There's a guy that said this. I'm going to give you some quotes today. Um, and I don't really know how to pronounce his last name, so I'm just going to do my version of it. Uh, Richard Rohr, because I think that's like the coolest last name. Like, what's your last name? Rohr. Like, oh, okay. I'll listen to you, right? He says this. He says, how you do anything is how you do everything. You're like, whoa, that's deep right there. How you do anything is how you do everything. So that means that the little things I do then impact everything I do. That means when I want everything to be better, then I need to focus on anything that I do, right? And so this is how we are going today, getting back to the anything and everything that we touch. Now, where are we at in Scripture? So we have seen the Jericho walls fall. We've seen God move miraculously in the process. We've seen all of that. And, and the uniqueness of all of this is that Jericho was not a dress rehearsal for the children of Israel. And sometimes in life, we think that our life, our experiences with God, it's just a dress rehearsal. And what does that mean? That means that, you know what, I'll just kind of just see how it goes, and if it oh, I'll just do better later. Right? I'll just, I'll just put my heart out there to anybody and just see how they handle it. And then, you know, I'll fix the problems later. Right? And, we, and we, sometimes we bring that into our life of just doing a dress rehearsal. But Jericho was not a dress rehearsal. It was setting the stage of how they were going to do the rest of their life. Just as God is doing with us today. How you handle what is in your hands today is how the rest of your life will be directed. Like, whoa, that's a big deal, right? Yeah, it is. That's what God wants you to understand, and what you hold matters. And so God is teaching the children of Israel in this time, yes, how the land was won is great, but how it was won is how it will be sustained, right? We want the hoop and the holler, let's go, Jesus, right? All of that, let's run out here and save the world. But how's tomorrow, right? Are you going to love them tomorrow? All right, how's, how's your walk with the Lord? Are you, are you going to walk in discipleship? Are you going to walk in sanctification with the Lord? And so we have to understand that Jericho and the process that God was leading them on was for how this new land, this new life, would be sustained. And so where, where are the children of Israel and what has God done? What has he taught them through this process? Well, this, what has he done? He's, he's brought them out of captivity. He brought them to the Jordan River, and they said, you know what? There's fortified cities there's giants in the land, we're going to pass, God. Even though you promised us to do so, we're not going to honor your promise, and we're going to go our own way. And so in this time, he's teaching them something deeper about the importance of honor. And this is where we have to go this morning is, is really how is our honor today? Because he taught them, hey, I need to be honored and trusted in the process. And so what did they do? They went 40 years wandering around until a generation had to die, until some people would say, God, we'll honor you no matter what. And so those people, again, had another chance to come to the Jordan River. Now, at this time, it's not shallow. It's at flood stage. Remember the Mukau I talked about floating across, dangerous, all of that. God brings them to the stage, to the front. And says, are you willing to follow me? Yeah, I'll honor you, God. 
We will go where you say go. And so in that moment, what does he tell them to do? Wait. God, we've been waiting 40 years, right? Let's, let's get across this Jordan River. We'll build a boat. We'll do whatever it is. No, no, I need you to wait until I tell you. Why? Because he needs to be honored first, right? And then what does he do? He tell, they get to cross the Jordan. And, and what does he tell them? Well, before that, he tells them to consecrate themselves, right? Again, honor. Make sure I'm leading you and you're not leading you, right? Then after they cross the Jordan River, what does he tell them again to do? Wait. Deal with your past. Are you willing? And in this moment, he's saying, are you willing again to honor me? I know you want to go and, and take all the, the fortified villages and all the town. I know you want to do all the victorious things, but there's some things in your past that you need to deal with. Will you honor me in that? So again, they had to choose. Yes, we will deal with our past. I know we're grown men. But we're going to deal with our past. And then what does God do? He, he, he shows them in the process, this whole process, something that we, we kind of skipped over how to cross the Jordan. Remember that? He said, put the Ark of the Covenant first. Put the Ark of the Covenant before you, that no matter where you go in your life, you do not step unless the Holy Spirit, with, unless the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, is moving before you. What is that teaching them? God, I will not go unless you go. I will not step unless you step. Again, honor. God, I'll honor you in every step of my life. And this is deep. So it's not about trying to get everything right. No, it's something, something so much deeper. It's, God, how is my honor? Because you know when you want to fix something, do something, plan something, see something move, you want to move it yourself instead of what God has conditioned the children of Israel to do is wait, honor. How is your honor today? I look to somebody in your greatest, deepest, like, preacher voice and just say, honor. Just say, come on, talk to somebody today. It's a good, good time to talk. <laughs> honor, we got to get it. See, God has continually taught and desires to be first. You know what? Maybe, maybe you like what I just said, but I got another quote from MJ. Maybe you'll listen to that one too as well. But MJ said this, Michael Jordan says, the more you sweat in practice, the less you bleed in battle. The more you sweat in practice, the less you bleed in battle. And I, I like this because that's really where God is leading us today. All right. Hook me up with another one until this works. I got it. I'm fired up today. So. Still good? Speak to me. There we go. All right. We're back. If it goes, I'm going to be loud today anyway. <laughs> All right. So we're good. All right. So we, so we talked about MJ. That, man, the quote just shook the place. All right. Because this is what God is wanting us to do is, is how you get, how you know the basics, how, how you relate to God daily, does matter how your battles are going to be faced, right? I don't, I don't really want to bleed in a bunch of battles. I want to be successful and walk with God in his anointing and his presence. And so what he has taught the Israelites is, hey, you need to honor me first. And what that is, is not a new concept for them. They would have understood this. They would have been taught. And this is something that has not changed from then to today. And that is the law of first things. Now, you've been in our church a while. You know this law. Because we do, we walk this out. We honor God at the first of the year. Right? We, we pray and we, sat, we uh, fast together. And then what else do we do? We honor God on first Wednesday, the first of the month. And then what else do we do? We honor God at the first of the week today. And this is something that's not new. This is actually the character of God. And so how is it, I want you to get two concepts really quick today. And the first one is this, the first part of all God gives us should be given back to him. And the first thing, and so Genesis 4 talks about Abel, and this is before any written law was written. This is before any command was given, but yet Abel knew the heart and the character of God. And he said, anything coming from my animals, the firstborn is yours, God. And he already knows the character. And then we see further on in scripture. I'm going to go fast with this. We have a lot today. Genesis 34 says, the first of every offspring belongs to me. That's God. 
And then it goes down in verse 26 of 34. It says, bring the first fruits of, every, of your soil to the house of the Lord. What is it saying? Everything's, every first thing is God's. And so it's not to be argued with. It's to be understood that this is a character of God and that everything first belongs to him. And then it goes down. The second thing I want you to get is what we do with the first determines what happens with the rest. Don't miss this point. What you do with the first determines what happens with the rest. God has been trying to teach the children of Israel this. And he's trying to teach us today. In Exodus 34, 20, we read the first part of it. But it says, yes, everything, the first of every, of every animal, the womb belongs to me. And it says in verse 20, redeem the, the firstborn donkey with a lamb. If you do not redeem it, break its neck. You're like, what in the world? God doesn't love animals. I love animals. What's happening here? But he's saying in this, in this moment, that's better off not to have the animal than to dishonor God this way. It's better off not to have it at all than to not let God be a part of it. So this is big. Because when we take it ourselves, then that's not his blessing, his anointing on it. And God is teaching us in this moment that he doesn't need a donkey. He doesn't need a lamb. He doesn't need your grain. He doesn't need a cow. He doesn't need it. No, no. What, what, what is he asking us? Will you honor me first? Will the first of every, will you honor me? When, when there's conflict in your life, will you, will you honor me? When there's joy, will you honor me? When you have produce, will you honor me? And so the issue is this, is that we have to understand is that we freely receive and we freely give. And both require open hands. We freely receive what? God's grace, his mercy, his salvation, his blessing, his direction, enough, right? We freely receive that, but also we're called to freely give too as well. We're, we're to give, we're to give forgiveness, we're to give this way of our resource, our talent, our ability. We are, and all of that is done how? Not with closed fist, but God use me. God, I receive it, but God use me as well, amen? And so we have to understand this, and, and it's this thought, if I can find it, uh, God only blesses what we give him. Let me say it again, God only blesses what we give him. You're saying, I've been trying to give, but he's saying, I've been trying you to get you to give this way for like 28 years. I can only bless what you give me. I can only be a part of what you give me. And so this is what he's telling us today is how is your honor game? How are you honoring? Are we in practice? Are we honoring him this way? God can only bless what we give him. And so, man, this is, this is a tough one. Remember, we're practicing. I kind of set the stage today. And then we're going to kind of, I want to teach you the, the challenges to this. Because we can hoop and holler and say, God, I'm going to honor you. But we all know that there's some challenges to honor God. Right, because we, we want our stuff, we want our time. We're we like, God, I'm working, I don't see you out here sweating. All that we have all the challenges, and so the challenge that I want you to get this morning is, is really the impact of shortcuts. You can write that down if you're taking notes. The impact of shortcuts this morning, I was hustling around to get to church, and and uh, I went to the, the dryer, pulled out my jeans because you got I can't I can't preach like Isaiah, all right? I got to be clothed, all right? And so I, I need I needed some jeans, I put them on, um, and uh, I needed I needed them now, not later. And so the the warmth I felt was just that they weren't all the way dry. And they were wet. Anybody with me? Yeah. Put on some jeans. They're not all the way dry, a little wet, you know. And you're like, oh. And, and so, uh, man, it, it looked good, but it, it didn't feel good afterwards. Are you with me? And so, hey, thank the Lord they're dry second service. First service, a little suspect. All right. <laughs> but isn't that how we do in life? Man, it looks like it's, it's, it looks like I'm ready to go do this. It, it looks like, you know, I'm supposed, and then when we walk into it, oh, man, that was a shortcut. Ah, I should have waited, right? And we're people of the shortcut, right? You ever been to amusement park? The people in front of you look another way. You're like, mm, okay, mm, got in front of them, right? Shouldn't have got distracted. We all about jumping in front of the line and not leaning to the one who can put us in the front of the line. Right, we're always trying to do a shortcut. And so in where we're at in scripture is Joshua 6. And so we're going to talk about this guy, Achan. 
And so God has commissioned again the children of Israel to follow him in his command. Now, we have already talked about the walls of Jericho falling and what God has commissioned them. Hey, I'm going to give you the entire city, but I'm requiring you to give to me first. I've established you got everything, but you will honor me first. And so they understood this. They also understood the law of the first. And here we go. I'm going to jump down to verse 18 here. And it says this. It says, and you by all means abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed. When you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel accursed and trouble it. So it's saying when you take these things, not only is it going to affect you, it's going to infect, affect the entire camp. Verse 19, but all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. He's saying, this is what you do. You have everything else, but you, you have to honor me this way. And so that's like a good deal, right? Hey, God, you're giving me everything, but you require this. Okay, that's, that's, I got that, right? God, you, you parted the waters. We walked on dry land. That was awesome. I'm ready to see that again. I saw the, the walls fall, and we went over them, and we, and we conquered all of Jericho. That was awesome. I want to be a part of that. Why would we ever want to take what is God's when he gives you that kind of victory? But then we got our boy Achan. Achan. He, maybe he didn't see the water. I don't know. Maybe he, didn't see, maybe, maybe he kind of fl- skipped over the dry land. I don't know. Maybe he closed his eyes when everybody sang and screamed and the walls. I don't know. Aiken, Aiken, what are you doing, Aiken? I don't know, Aiken. Um, well, Aiken, um, he, he took cloak and, and silver and a bar of gold. You know, why would he do that? Why would our boy Achan, after all of this has gone on, take something for himself, right? We want to boo and hiss at Achan. Don't we? Like, what are you thinking, bro? Why are you taking stuff when God has done so much marvelous works, but yet you chose to take? But you, before we boo and before we throw things at Achan, we got to probably understand Aiken a little bit, right? Um, he's probably thinking practically. Right? I, my family have been walking in the, in the desert 40 years. We don't have a lot of stuff. You know, manna doesn't sell very good. All of this. So what are, what are we going to do? You know what? We're going to have this promised land. I would like to set up a little business, make it work out for myself and my family. I'm thinking what? Practically. I'm thinking about the five-year, the 10-year, the 30-year plan. And so it makes sense that as I see all of this stuff, It's not going to harm somebody for me to put a little in my pocket, right? A little gold bar. And you're like, a gold bar, that's a lot, right? But really, what Scripture says is no one noticed it. Now, you got to listen to me this morning. Y'all wait. No one noticed this. No one noticed the gold bar. It was really a footnote in Scripture. And so he had to be like, oh, you know, that's okay. Because anytime we think the way Achan is, we can always justify holding on to the resource. Anytime our mind goes to this practically thinking, you can always come up with a rule or a reason why the rule doesn't apply to you. Oh, y'all hear what I just said? I'm in there with you, right? When we think this practically way, then we can always come up with, you know, that doesn't apply to me. That's not to me. And this is where he is. And we forget the fact that God sees everything. And this is where we're getting back to the basics. In Job, it talks about this. Remember one of the first books written. This I love it. It's like fresh ink off the page. It talks about the character of God. And here we go. It says this in Job. It says, for he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. He's saying, okay, I want you to get, I see it all. Aiken, I'm with you while you're picking up the gold. I'm with you while you're watching that. I'm with you on your weekends. I'm with you. I'm with you. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to condemn you. But I am with you. And I see it all. And so Achan decides to take. And what's happening with Joshua at this moment? We can't get him away from the story, right? So Joshua just saw the, the walls fall. Pretty big day right? No matter, you've been praying for something, somebody gets saved, somebody get healed. It happens. You are on top of the world, right? This is where Joshua's at. Scripture actually says Joshua's name was known. It, it spread over the region. He was famous. He was like Michael Jordan, 
Everybody knew him. Everybody talked about the children of Israel and the God of the Israelites and their leader, Joshua. So Joshua, probably hanging out with the crumbled walls, I don't know, but he also knows that God just didn't give him that city, right? He gave him the whole region, all the promised land. And so what does he do? He says, you know what? There is a little town called AI, right? You just say the two letters. That's, that's how you know the name of the town. It's that small, right? He's like, there's a little town, AI. It's just, and, and we're going to conquer it. So he gets 3,000 3, troops, you say, that sounds like a lot, but you know what? Just on the east side, there's 40,000 Israelites, all right? And so he had numerous amount of people he could use, but what did he do? Kind of just, you know, just being in the moment. Jericho walls fell down. Hey, it's a small village. Here's 3,000 men. You should be able to take it. They should, right? And so he's in his moment, kind of, you know, just sitting back, looking at what God is doing. All of a sudden, the next thing he hears are screams of his men running back fearing for their lives screaming yelling the fact that they saw 30, 36 of their men massacred by a small town that should have been easy to to conquer and so what does he do what is his response and that's joshua 7 and it'll, you can put it on the screen if you want what does joshua do what's his response he falls to his face he falls on his knees he bows his face unto god he's like why is this happening he rips his clothes he gets alone with the lord in the stress in the trouble he didn't pull out his phone and start tweeting and start going on tiktok let me just i can't believe you got no he just falls on his knees and say god i gotta know what's going on and God says this to him, you will lose every battle until you give me what belongs to me. You have stolen. There's sin in your camp. What? We, we, we conquered Jericho. What are you talking about? We did everything that you have taught, I think. But God says there's sin in your camp. Right? And this is where it gets all up in our grill, gets all up in the mess, right? And Joshua says, we are going to deal with this. And they bring Achan in. And God tells them what happened. And Achan says he did take. And Achan was dealt with. And so the issue is here is that we have to understand what did God request. He requests to be honored first. He didn't need the stuff, but how will you honor? And we have to understand this today. As long as we think we possess anything, and it'll be on the screen, as long as we think we possess anything, our possessions possess us. I know we don't like that in American culture, but this is God culture. As long as we think we possess anything, our possessions possess us. We are only called as Christians, as people, to steward what we've been given. It's God's business. It's God to say, do this, do that. We are to steward it. And so the thinking of, I need to get, I need to obtain, I need to, I need to, I, I need to hold what is mine, that's a theology of scarcity. So it's the mentality of this fact that I don't know if God really wants to bless me, so I need to make sure I keep mine. What's mine is not yours. I'll tell you when I give it to you right? It's the theology of scarcity that you don't have a God that's for you, that you need to steal from him. You need to steal and do things and keep it away because you don't believe that God is for you. And so the theology of scarcity is close to the, the theology of selfishness. That means that, again, that I am more concerned with myself and my family than what happens to the community. And this is what Achan was dealing with. And what happens is, is life easily conditions you this way because we have the anointing, we have the blessing of God, and what happens is, man, we, we start shooting the baskets thinking that, man, we're going to score, we're going to win the game, we're going to do great things, and you've been playing, you think you've been playing on one of those little carnival rims, right? Y'all know that's like too tiny to even fit a basketball. And you're like, this is my life. I, every time I'm trying to do something good, it's like clang and goes off there and goes off there. I don't even think a basketball can even fit into a rim. And God's speaking to you and say, no, no, no. You don't even think you can achieve that. I've given you a double portion of blessing. Will you understand that I'm an abundant God? That I have abundant measures to advance you farther than you could ever know? And I, I'm the God that knows that, that two balls fit into a hoop, right? Let's see that picture. Oh, snap, right? Didn't know that. 
Because you know you've been playing basketball at times. You can't make a hoop. But look what happens. That's God perspective. That's the abundant perspective. God, that you have double portion. You can doubly do what I, I can't do. Right? This is who he is. And I love, if you don't believe me, please b- believe this scripture. It says this in Second Corinthians. Mercy and find grace in your time of need. That's a God who loves you, right? Amen. He has all of these things for us. And so we have to be very careful not to try to shortcut him, but to honor him and say, God, you lead my life. Are you still with me? I'm going to tell you, we've had God do so many things in our church. We had God move in so many people's lives. And I'm going to tell you, it's not because of me or because of how cool this garage is or any of that, like, or these pink chairs. It's because we have chosen to honor God and say, God, will you just move and do, do what you want to do? And so I want to show you this video as we prepare. And I'm going to tell you, I got this video late at night, and I was praying. I was like, Lord, I don't even know where to, what's it? We're going to put this in the message, and I just feel like it's right here. That Sir Kate, who was our worship leader, was like, I just really feel like, like the Holy Spirit is just impressing uh, on me that we need to stay in this moment. And so we're going to go into another song. If I can trust you, show me. I was like, oh, okay, Lord. <laughs> and, and I remember in that moment of just like, okay, here we go. As soon as I walked in that bathroom, there was a sign. I look up, and I'm standing in front of Pastor Chad, and I'm just like, I don't know what's going on, but something's happening. And it's Joshua 1, 9 that my brother had tattooed on his arm. He's like, how about we just pray? It's the one verse, the only verse, that could have showed me that God knows exactly where I was. We came on the one-year anniversary. That was the day that our lives began to change. It was like a community we didn't even know we needed. I met Chad. I was going over to a friend's house for a small group. Told him, hey, I'm opening a coffee shop next week. And then my dad started getting a little bit more curious. He said, well, I'm announcing today to our congregation that we're going to have a building and we're going to have a coffee shop in it. I eventually started getting more curious. I felt like God was telling me to sell my coffee shop and got baptized and started going to church camp. God drew my attention to that building knowing that it was going to end up in this building as High Street Coffee the whole time. I got to see what a family actually looks like by being a part of this church. When I come here, I feel like this is my family. You walk in the door and you feel like you're at home. Just coming to the coffee shop, I would never would have thought that. I just wanted a cup of coffee. We break bread together and, and we're willing to fight for each other. I didn't feel connected to a church until I really got involved. It's just a big family. And then you get to meet people, you get to know their names. It's just wonderful. To understand like that God was real. If I hadn't gone into that restroom that day to hide out, it's very likely I wouldn't even be here. And that what he had for us was so much better than than what we thought like we knew. God can change everything. It has totally, totally changed my life. And it's because of uh, you know, somebody saying yes yeah. to plan a church. To reach people with the life giving message of Jesus so they might become fully devoted followers of Jesus. That's what we're about. To reach people with the life-giving message of Jesus. You say, why are you planting a church in McAllister to reach people with the life-giving message of Jesus Christ? I'm telling you. We have so many testimonies that weren't even on this video of marriages restored, healings happen in bodies. And I'm going to tell you, there is a family in McAllister who probably are ready to sign the divorce papers that God's saying, just hold on. Just for a moment, I got a community coming your way. That's going to, you're, they're going to love you. They're going to help you. I got somebody that's going to believe for you to pray for you. Come on. This is what it's about. This is why we do what we do. That every life in these seats, every life out there matters so much. And what we do matters. And the challenge is, is that we would somehow think that our gifting, our ability, our time does not matter. And we let the impact of impulse take over. To say, you know what, I just, I don't know if I should come today. Because I don't feel like I'm, I, I matter. But as you heard in that video, every person that was on that video talked about, when I walked in, I was loved. When I walked in, somebody cared for me. They met me at the corner, whatever it was. All of that happened. Why? Because there were people doing that. 
You say the community culture church is a great church. No, it's not. Not if the people don't love. Not if the people aren't loving. Not if the people aren't connecting. We're the people. That's what we are. And so the challenge is to say, what can I do? What can I be a part of? All of it. Everything. We don't have kids' classes if somebody's not teaching the kids. We don't have a door greeter to, to, to greet Jeanette down the street if somebody's not doing it. We don't have, if we don't have somebody cleaning the church, we don't have a bathroom clean enough that Cody even wants to walk into, right? right? I'm going to tell you, everything matters. But impulse, when we're led by our impulses, it will lead us away. And I pray, God, I don't understand how I'm going to, do, to, to finish this message out. But God really spoke to me on this last part. You still need to speak this. Because if we don't get this, we're going we're gonna to veer off into, again, what the children of Israel did. And so you got to understand this impact of impulse can take away what we know that God is going to do here in this place in the years to come and what he is going to do in McAllister as well. And so what is happening, man, AI did defeat the Israelites that day. But they dealt with their sin. They, de de they dealt with their lack of honor. And they had victory over AI. But what happened in that moment is all that northern region became scared. And so instead of trying to fight them with brawn and fight them with their, their weapons, they decided we're going to use our cunning ability to lie to them. Sounds like somebody, right? Sounds like the devil. Yeah. To lie to them. And we're going to get them that way. And so what they did is they did that. They, they, they dressed up like they were from a far country. They, their wineskins they made old so they looked like they're, they're about to burst. And they got their bread and made it moldy so it looked like they were traveling far. And they came to the Israelites and said, hey, we're from a far country. And this is in chapter 9. And from a far country, will you have compassion on us? Look what they're doing. He's attacking the strength of God's people compassion they're attacking they're coming behind an area that they feel strong in and maybe they have overlooked and so they come in will you have compassion on us and they even use God talk they said this they said because of the name of the Lord your God we have come your way so what is that teaching us in this moment that just because somebody goes to church says God doesn't mean that they are bearers of God's will not at all. They can say God. It doesn't mean that they are from God. And so what is this moment teaching us is that maybe we need to understand that God wants to, to, to direct us in everything we do. And right here, we can look at the Israelites, and there's no real sin that we see. There's nothing besides this one verse. And it says this in 914, the Israelites sampled their provisions but did not inquire of the Lord. Sampled that they ate together, but they didn't inquire, if, is this of God or not of God? Are these people for us or not? And we have to understand that we can't let our guard down from past victories that we think somehow qualify us to overcome our present challenges. They leaned in on Jericho, and they didn't honor God first in what came their way. And I'm going to tell you, any person, any relationship, job, whatever it is, who gets the first, God does. And he's teaching them in this moment that we are to inquire of him first. And I'm going to tell you, we've had great victories, as you saw in this video. But there are great victories to come. And we can't ever get away from the basics of who God is, how we honor him, and how we pray and seek him out. We, we have because we pray. I'm going to tell you, we can't overlook that. And I'm, in James 4, 2, it says this, you do not have because you do not ask God. What is James saying in the moment? He said, I know you're trying to fix everything, and he talks about wars and people killing each other, all this, you're trying to fix it, but you have not positioned me right. And he says, you do not have because you do not ask God. And this is what he's telling us today, I believe, is that we can't ever get past asking God, asking God for direction in our life. 
Have you guys ever been to a store and you're looking for this specific item and you look and look and look and probably, it's probably a guy who did this, but you're looking and looking. You don't want to ask anybody and you're like, I'm going to find it eventually, right? And there's workers all around dressed in their stuff and you could ask any one of them. You spent 30 minutes trying to find something. Finally, you break down and you say, okay, I'm going to go ask somebody. And you go ask and they're like, yeah, it's on aisle 12. It's on the bottom. It's right there. It's right next to this one. And you're like, oh my goodness, I could have, I could have saved so much time. Just going to the source. And I believe that's what God's saying to us today. Directions aren't for smart people, right? People, you're like, why, are they, why is their life so blessed? Directions aren't for smart people. It's just for those who are looking. That's what it is. God, I need your direction in my life. God, I will not move without your blessing. God, I will not move without your leading of your Holy Spirit. This is what it means to be a Christian. God will not step without you. I will not make that the business decision unless I know it's of you. God, I'm not going to cross the Jordan until you tell me to cross it. How's our honor today? And maybe today you're dealing with anxiety from big decisions. Maybe what I said at the beginning of the service about the years to come is just kind of just messing with your mind. You're feeling a lot of anxiety. Maybe you say, Chad, you know what? I've tried to pray. I've tried to do that. And God's tugging on your heart about doing it again. I think if we're honest today that some of us have been laying our head down at night and and the same thought has been coming up. Or Or you've been alone by yourself and something's been tugging on your spirit that you need to deal with. I'm gonna tell you today, that God's brought you here to hear this message. To know that he's not done with you. But maybe we need to get back to some basics of honoring him. So I want to give you these three scriptures real fast. But it's really a prayer over you right now as we close. And it's this. is Maybe we do feel anxious. Well, what does scripture say about that? Well, it says this. It says, do not be anxious about anything. Well, how is that possible? This way. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. It says, in any anxiety that comes in, what am I going to do? I'm going to humble myself for the Lord. I'm going to begin to thank Him for what He's done in my life. And then what happens in my life? He brings the healing. He brings the, the peace. I say, Pastor Chad, I just, I'm just struggling right now. Matthew 6 might be for you. It says this, it says, but when you go, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees you in secret will reward you. Say, so maybe you've been caught up too much and trying to do all the schedule that's before you. And you just kind of just been praying on the way, right? We've all done that. That's okay. But God also wants you to honor him with your time. You say, well, I don't even have a closet, Pastor Chad. Just get alone. Just get alone and just say, God, I just want to be with you. I don't want to make a move unless you move. I don't want to speak unless it's your words, God. I need to know. And you get in that prayer closet and you seek after God. And maybe you've done some of that. And maybe you feel alone today. I love what James says in chapter 5. It says, therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. I love this because sometimes we think that Christianity is just a solo sport. Now, I do my prayer time. I do my closet time. and, And then God is saying, you know what? I called you to take your issue and go and confess it to somebody else. God, I've been dealing with the same thing over and over again. He's like... Will you go and confess to somebody else? Will you, will you go do that? I've designed this thing where there's power in community. And he says through that, not that the person heals you. No, 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 no. The humility and the honor, God heals you. He's asking you, will you be humble enough to confess your sins and get together and pray with one another and deal with the issue? And he says, you will be healed. And then he says something about you that maybe you've forgotten. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. 
is powerful and effective. I'm going to tell you, listen up today before I pray and close. Because you need to get this. The prayer of your inserted name there. The prayer of chat. Put your name in this. The prayer of whoever. The prayer of me. You're like, I can't say I'm righteous. Oh, yeah, you can. Jesus paid the price for you to say that. That's who you are. A righteous person standing with the Father. Your prayer is powerful. It's effective. What does that mean? We need your prayers. This place, this area of Eufaula needs your prayers. This launch team meeting that we are launching tonight needs your prayers, needs your commitment. There's people in this room that need to hear your story. And sometimes we let our schedule dictate whether we tell our story. No, you always tell it. You don't miss an opportunity to tell your testimony to somebody else. And it's powerful. Got to get back to the basics. We believe in prayer. We believe that God heals. We believe that God empowers. And we believe that we walk with him every day. That's who we are. You know what? When we connect with him, last thing. When we connect with him, what do we get? All that I said, we also get this word called discernment. Discernment. So you know what? When those people come in and they say, you know what? We're for you. Or this person comes in, I'm for you. Oh, something in my spirit is checking me right now. God, I don't know. I'm not going to make that decision. I'm not going to align with that person. I'm not going to do that until I know, God, that this is for and this is, this is about you. It's called discernment. That means that we don't have to walk fearful in any situation or any place. We walk with the anointing of the Holy Spirit to discern what is right and wrong wherever you go. That's amazing. So today, I just want to pray over us. And I believe God, I, I, I said it first service, I say it now. I believe God wants to do a miracle. And it may be today that you need healing in your body. You're sitting in a room with people who have been healed physically by God. Maybe that he wants to give you peace, wants to calm your mind. Maybe he wants to remind you that he's in control. And it's time to honor him again. That's a miracle today. Maybe today you don't know him. Online church are here, and you need to know him. There's no greater miracle than salvation. And I want to pray with you about that. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, let's pray. I'm going to ask you not to move around, but let's just be alone with the Lord in this moment. Father, I thank you as we focus on you and you have spoken so strongly. God, sometimes we can rely on those past victories and thank you so much for them. But God, you are the way maker. We, do, we don't worship the past way. We worship the way maker. And so right now, God, we honor you in the way that you are making a way in our life. And we lay everything at your feet right now. Lord, I want to pray over somebody that needs to know you. And if that's you online or in this place with every head bowed and every eye closed, let's just talk to him. He wants to hear from you. I don't heal you. I don't save you. He does. He wants to talk to you. And so if that's you today, scripture says this for you, that if you'd confess and believe in, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God loved you enough to send a son to die for you, that you'd be saved. Eternity shifts for you in this moment, in this moment, this is that big of a deal. Will you confess today? Will you put your trust in him today? Will you talk to him right now? If that's you, just talk to him. And as you are talking, all of heaven is rejoicing in this moment of what you are doing right now. And God, I thank you for that moment that is happening. I rejoice with you. And God, I thank you for what you've already spoken today about a church, about a people who needs to honor you. God, I pray. If there's anybody here today that needs to get their sin out, well, you know what? He says he is faithful to forgive you today if you'll just give it to him. And so, God, I do that for me. Anything that in me that is not right, Lord, is yours. I give it to you right now. And I pray that over our congregation, that we would do this. God, we choose to honor you right now. We receive today your forgiveness. Oh, God, we receive right now the power of your Holy Spirit guiding us, directing us, giving us peace, giving us understanding. We receive it right now in the name of Jesus. We agree and we pray and we all say amen.